Hi, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist and welcome to another COVID-19 debunking video. In this video, I'm going to be revisiting an old friend, Ert van den Bosche. Dr. van den Bosche is a PhD in virology and a doctor of veterinary science, who earlier in the pandemic became a hero of COVID conspiracy theorists when he claimed that COVID vaccination would be really bad for everybody. I made a video about those ideas several months ago, but now that the COVID vaccines are much more widespread, I figured I'd check in on him and his ideas and see how he's doing. So let's get started. Now, the video I'm covering today is his most recent video on his YouTube channel, which is about 30 minutes long. But in the first five minutes or so, he goes over a bunch of what he calls positive news about COVID vaccines, which include the facts that COVID vaccines have reduced the morbidity and mortality rates of COVID-19, as well as the transmission. These facts are all true, and I was genuinely surprised to see him acknowledge all of it. But to my disappointment, well, you'll see. Despite all this good news, and these are facts and data, why then am I saying that this pandemic is not, is not at all moving into uh, the right uh, direction? Yep, he still doesn't think that COVID vaccines are a good idea. Let's hear his reasoning. And so when you combine all these factors, the low infectious pressure or the low worst infectious pressure due to mass vaccination, combined with the fact that the um, asymptomatically infected vaccinees can still spread the virus, and uh, this combined with suboptimal immune pressures, this makes in fact of vaccines a kind of reservoir where the virus can circulate and where uh, variants uh, that have mutations that enable them to become more infectious, that enable the variant to become more infectious will have a competitive advantage. Okay, so that clip is him summarizing about 15 minutes worth of his video. So let's break it down. All of his claims come down to this idea that SARS-CoV-2 can persist and replicate in the body of a vaccinated person longer than it can an unvaccinated person, all the while developing mutations that can help it evade the immune system. So the question that we can ask is, how does the viral dynamics of a SARS-CoV-2 infection look in a vaccinated person versus an unvaccinated person. And when we do that, when we do the experiments to find that answer, we see that vaccinated people clear the virus faster than unvaccinated people. What this all essentially boils down to is the fact that SARS-CoV-2 does not have as good of a time replicating in the body of a vaccinated person versus an unvaccinated person. In the body of a vaccinated person, SARS-CoV-2 will replicate less. That means it will have fewer chances to develop mutations that allow it to evade an immune system. So right away, that idea just doesn't check out at all. Vaccinated people are not variant factories. They are making it harder for SARS-CoV-2 to form new variants. People who are not vaccinated and healthy, they are perfectly capable of coping with all these variants because their natural antibodies, their innate antibodies, do not discriminate between, uh, between those variants. And so this is where he starts to get even more ridiculous. He thinks that vaccine-induced immunity is going to apply too much selective pressure to SARS-CoV-2, and that's going to make it evolve new, more dangerous variants. But somehow those rules don't apply to this innate immune system that he's talking about. And the way he's talking about innate immunity here is not correct. Innate immunity does not involve antibodies. Antibodies are part of the adaptive immune response. He's not really getting his terminology correct. And just to add to that, he says that these innate antibodies that are in naive individuals who have never seen SARS-CoV-2 don't discriminate against variants? What? No, the serum of naive individuals who have never seen SARS-CoV-2 don't have antibodies that can neutralize variants. That's because the adaptive immune system needs to see something before it knows how to fight it. I said it before and I'll say it again. This is the quality of the heroes 
propped up by COVID conspiracy theorists. It's just sad. And it's very clear that the more youngsters and the more children you will enroll in those campaigns, the more the increased susceptibility, susceptibility of the non-vaccinated group will outweigh, in fact, the benefit of vaccinating the, uh, the elderly and the vulnerable people. What? No. And that's why we want to vaccinate those age groups. Unvaccinated people are free real estate for SARS-CoV-2 to infect, replicate, continue evolving, and continue forming new variants. That's why we want to vaccinate them, not only to protect them against the rare cases of disease that we see in young children, but also to prevent this virus from continuing to evolve and continuing to be a problem in society. But Eric Vandenbosch doesn't want that. So what um, does this mean when we now do uh, the, the, the mathematics and the calculations? He doesn't have any math or calculations. He just has this graph that he drew by hand with no numbers that he actually plugged into it. This graph is not based on any science. He literally made it up. No. Now, interestingly enough, after we have started vaccination, we no longer test healthy people Although all we have been doing is turning these healthy people into vaccinees, into healthy vaccinees. So why all of a sudden we do not longer test vaccinees, healthy vaccinees? Uh, we are. The CDC recommends that even a fully vaccinated person who comes into contact with a confirmed COVID case is recommended to get tested three to five days after their exposure. If they test positive, then the CDC has a policy where they ask clinical laboratories to send them those positive samples for sequencing so that they can track variants that may be infecting vaccinated people. What I was saying, we are still having these optimal uh, conditions, so now the virus will be able to overcome this higher level of immune pressure, which will ultimately lead, in fact, to resistance of the vaccines and, and uh, the resistance of the virus uh, towards the vaccine. And that is what, if we continue this mass vaccination, I'm sure uh, will, uh, will happen. I'm sure it will happen if we stop the mass vaccination and just let the virus spread. This idea of vaccine resistance is something that he posted a while ago when he made his LinkedIn post. He even likened it to how bacteria develop antibiotic resistance. This is completely wrong. And here's why. When a bacteria develops resistance to an antibiotic drug, it's because that drug targets one particular thing in the bacteria. If the bacteria mutates that thing that the antibiotic targets, it can become resistant. Doctors can get around this by administering multiple antibiotics to the same patient. This way, there are multiple things in the bacteria that are each targeted by a single antibiotic. The bacteria is much less likely to develop mutations in all of those targets at the same time. So this is much more effective when it comes to preventing resistance. Now, when it comes to vaccines, it is incorrect to think of the vaccine as one drug the same way we think of an antibiotic as one drug. The reason is because it's not the vaccine itself that's doing the work to protect you, it's your immune system. When your immune system mounts an immune response to the contents of the vaccine, you will end up producing multiple different antibodies and multiple different T cells that all recognize a specific site on, in this case, the spike protein, which is what ultimately is delivered to you by the vaccine. In other words, the protein would have to mutate multiple different sites in order to evade a polyclonal immune response. Couple that with the fact that T cells, which are really important cells that patrol your body and remove virus infected cells, will also be able to recognize that spike protein in ways that are different from the antibodies. And the ways that T cells will recognize this spike protein is different from person to person. So all of this is to say that the virus has to mutate a lot in order to escape the immune system. All of that mutation needs replication and time. Vaccines take away both replication and time from the virus. That's why vaccination is the only way out of this pandemic. 
And uh, then some people say, well, you know, there is this cellular immunity that is cross-protective, et, uh, et cetera. No, because people who are vaccinated, they are not primed for this protective uh, cellular responses. The vaccines do not induce uh, cell-mediated immunity that is protective and that is capable of eliminating virus-infected cells. Hang on, he thinks that vaccines don't elicit cellular immunity? This is measured. Yes, they do. Ever since the first phase three clinical trials of COVID vaccines last April, we've known that they do elicit cellular immunity. And he's just denying it. And last but not least, we still we need to work on, 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 on a new type of vaccines, not, not the type of second generation of vaccines because they want help. They, they have the same problem but a type of uh, vaccines that is first not interfering with the immunity of the uh, COVID-19 vaccinees and that is capable of inducing sterilizing immunity. Okay, so first of all, COVID vaccines do grant sterilizing immunity to an individual, but sterilizing immunity does not last because after you become immune to something, after your body mounts an immune response. Your sterilizing immunity is sterilizing only because you have high levels of antibodies circulating throughout your body. Those levels will wane over time, no matter what. But you are left with immune memory. You are left with the ability to mount an immune response much faster the next time you see that foreign antigen. Second, the idea that vaccine-induced immunity somehow interferes with other forms of immunity that's not a thing. That just doesn't happen. He has simply made that up. There's no evidence to suggest that that idea would have any ground to stand on. And third, this is the reason why I'm proposing that Ert van den Bosche is trying really hard to follow in Andrew Wakefield's shoes. For those who don't know, Andrew Wakefield is the infamously discredited doctor who faked data in order to scare the world into thinking that vaccines cause autism. Neither claim was true. Vaccines don't cause autism, and he didn't have a new vaccine. Ert van den Bosche here is claiming that he knows how to create a COVID vaccine which somehow circumvents all of these imaginary problems that he has put on the table. He is a grifter. He is trying to follow in Andrew Wakefield's shoes by spreading misinformation in order to gain money, clout, and attention. Ert van den Bosche, if you're watching, I emailed you inviting you to debate me publicly on any of these topics. So what do you say? Let's do it. Well, that's going to do it for Ert van den Bosche. He is needlessly spreading fear about COVID vaccines, which are highly effective and extremely safe. As always, all of the links to all of the science that I talk about in this video are linked in the description below so that you can check them out for yourself. And don't forget that also in the description is a link to the American Society for Virology town hall meetings, which are free and over Zoom, where you can go and ask virologists questions about the same topics discussed here. I guarantee they'll tell you the same thing. As always, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And if you like what I do, don't forget to subscribe so you can catch me next week where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then.